The Washington Post labeled Georgetown Law the most popular law school in the country year in and year out. Would you love to apply there? Well, today's show is for you. It's Dean of Admissions is our guest. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dream. Thanks for joining me for the 489th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Are you applying to law school this cycle? Are you planning ahead to apply to law school next year or perhaps later? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted Law School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash law dash quiz, complete the quiz, and you'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, take this short quiz at exhibit.com slash law dash quiz to obtain your free assessment. Now for today's interview, I'm delighted to have on Admission Straight Talk, Andrew Kornblatt, Meta and Keith Crack, Dean of Admissions and Associate Vice President of Graduate Admissions and Enrollment at Georgetown Law. A graduate of Harvard University and Boston College School of Law, Dean Kornblatt has been a member of the Georgetown community since 1980. He became Dean of Admissions at Georgetown Law in 1991 and served as Dean of Admissions at the Georgetown Public Policy Institute, now the McCourt School of Public Policy, from 2002 to 2016. It's hard to find someone with more experience in admissions. Dean Kornblatt, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me, Linda. And just in case you're wondering, we prefer experience rather than old at this job. So experience uh, I would, is a good I, one. I know, I know I you didn't say experience. that. I, know, I said I experience. I know, you uh, agree. No, 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 you agree. <laughs> others have said, wow, you've been here a long time. I prefer <laughs> experience rather than old war horse. So thank you right, for, right. for describing me that way. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Well, I also tend to refer to myself as experienced as opposed to old, but anyways, <laughs> I don't have quite as much experience as you, but still enough where I prefer the distinction. All right. Can just to dive in about Georgetown, can you give an overview of the more distinctive elements of the Georgetown Law School JD program? I think the two things that are most unique about Georgetown are its size and its location. Georgetown Law School is a large law school. I think it's the among or the largest in the in the United States. Uh, 575 entering students, an LLM program. It's a big law school, but it is a big law school, we think, or we work very hard to make it a big law school with a small law school feel. These are small classes. These the campus is now not when I began way back then, but now the campus is beautiful. It's like a small college, lots of different buildings. And we pay particular attention to individual students and their needs. We have big programs, but we have individual people who deserve individual attention. And so that's what we focus on. As far as location goes, because we are in Washington, DC, and because if you could, if I moved my camera, you could probably see the United States Capitol right behind me. Oh, and wow. <laughs> there would be the Supreme Court. It's a lovely view every morning when I look at it. Um, and that, so that puts us right at the heart of D.C. and right in the center of sort of law USA. This is where everything gets made, interpreted, enforced, implemented. That all happens probably within a 10 block radius of where I'm standing right now talking to you. And when you have that, as resources, when that's available to you. What that does is it sort of enhances just the electricity of what it is that you're be doing, what you're studying. So it's hands-on stuff, but it allows Georgetown to sort of be at the crossroads of theory and practice. When I went to law school all those years ago, and when people go to law school now, so much of it is about the theory of law and what happened back way back then and cases from the 1800s and blah, blah, blah. All of that's important. I'm not saying it isn't. But for this generation of law students, for the people I'm talking to, actually, they're hands on. They watch it happen on video. They stay attuned to every development, every tenth of a second through all the social media and all the alerts they get about life. This is a place that's right at the center of all of that. 
And that's part of our course structure too. It's where you can take any number. I mean, the plus side of being a big law school is you have that many more courses from which to choose. So no matter what you're interested in, if we have courses for it and a whole bunch of them, but if you wanna know where the, where the heart is beating, it's right outside my window. And I think that's what excites students when they come here. For sure. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But one of the things that, well, actually, let's let's stay with that. What are a few, like, very practically, I mean, I can certainly understand the electricity and the fact that, you know, you, you're steps away or blocks away from the, the Capitol and from the Supreme Court. What are some of the programs that are unique to Georgetown Law because of its location? So let me give you two. Okay. Uh, there's probably 200, but let me give you two. Um, because I know we want to talk about admissions too. So first, all law schools have clinical programs. Right. All law schools where you practice, or you sort of, you're, it's supervised practice where you represent clients and the, all the clinics are different. Every law school has clinics of some kind. Georgetown has the most in the country. This is expensive education, but we are committed to doing this. So you will take your first year classes then second or, th or third year, most in third year, but second or third year, you'll be a member of a clinic and clinic will be for course credit. And you could be representing juveniles, you could be representing tenants, you could be representing immigrants, you could be prosecuting cases, you could be working, there's a million different things and all, everybody listening here can certainly, you know, arrive at those or find those on the web. But being in Washington allows you to have that sort of commitment and resources and judges and, and access to courts that are nearby, really nearby. That's the first. Second, which is completely unique to Georgetown, is our Supreme Court Institute. The Supreme Court Institute is a program that was started, I don't know, 20 years ago, where all the, all the Supreme Court cases, cases going before the court, the big, the big nine before the Supreme Court, all of those classes are, all of those cases are mooted here at Georgetown, practiced yeah. here at Georgetown. And so we, when I started at 85%, now it's, I think we're at 99%. And so I'll give you an example of this. Um, as many of your listeners know, um, there, there's a very important Supreme Court case mixing the University of North Carolina and Harvard about the use of affirmative action. And that case is about to be argued in front of the Supreme Court, um, end of October, early November. The middle of October, I got a rare ticket to this. I will be going down in our replica of the Supreme Court right here on campus, and there'll be a limited number of us, and we will sit in as the, as the attorneys for, for one side. You can only do one side. They sort of try out their case. Then we'll have judges wow. who will play the role of justices. It's very informative, which is nice, but it's also really cool. And so Sounds you get to hear this stuff and they get questioned. This is only happening. A Supreme Court Institute isn't going to happen somewhere else. It's going to happen in D.C. And that's sort of a, a D.C.-ish kind of thing. Add to that sort of the, the job opportunities, the internship possibilities. That's where D.C. really kicks in as part of a law student's experience. Thank you. That was a great answer. I noticed in preparing for the call that Georgetown also has something called Curriculum A and Curriculum B in the first year. Can you touch on that? That's pretty distinctive. Sure, very distinctive. It is mo it, almost every law school, um, first year law school, you take what the school tells you to take, and it's not that different than what I took when I was a first year student. At Georgetown, you have a choice of whether you want to be in Curriculum A or Curriculum B. We have five sections of roughly 90 to 100 students per section. Four of the sections are curriculum A. One of the sections is curriculum B. The difference here is curriculum B, this is shorthand for all of this, but curriculum B sort of gets at more of the why and not only the what. So if you are in most in curriculum A, you're going to be studying cases and, and learning through case method. You do that with curriculum B, but a curriculum B, they're going to want to know what was going on in, in the country at that time? What other, what was the meaning behind of this? It's a more liberal artsy, if you will, approach to this. And for students who learn best this way, who really want to know context, who really want to know all, you'll get some of that in curriculum. Eh? You'll get some of that at every law school. Sure. But it's where the emphasis is. And curriculum B is designed for more students. And also in curriculum B, 
we combine classes. So contracts, which is a di distinct course from torts at almost every law school, at Georgetown for curriculum B, that's one class. And so it's more sort of horizontal learning rather than just vertical, you encompassing other disciplines. It's interdisciplinary. Again, it's not dramatically different. No one's getting out of first year law school at Georgetown without learning the basic stuff. But if you do curriculum B, you'll get more of a context that way. And, and it's as the students are admitted and at, hopefully, and as then they do more research and learn about it, students come here to visit, they sit in on classes, we, we do Zooms with professors who teach it, students who have taken it. You'll, who's ever listening now, if, if Georgetown's where you want to be and I say yes, then you know what? There's going to be lots of opportunities for you to educate yourself about this. Wow. All right. And the bar passage rates for A and B are the same. same? Yeah. And employment rates the same. The whole the success second and third year, we would it wouldn't last as long as it's lasted if, if that weren't the case. For sure. Now, last year, which was the 2020-2021 cycle, saw a surge in applications to all law schools. And Georgetown led the way with a mind-boggling stratospheric 14,052 applications and a 41% increase in application volume over the previous cycle. Now, when I last checked LSAC, which was actually in August, it reported that overall applicant volume for the 2022 entering class was down slightly, 11.7% from the previous year, which had experienced this enormous surge, and even down minimally 0.7% from two years ago. I know that Georgetown had that 41% increase in application volume. What was Georgetown's experience this past cycle? And what do you anticipate for the upcoming cycle? The one word you forgot to use or you that I would add to the year, to the two years when things spiked so dramatically was exhausting. Let's throw that I'm in. I'm sure it was exhausting. Exhausting. <laughs> um, but it was, it was like this rocket ship we all got on. And all of a sudden, hey, we're way up. We're way up. We're not coming down. We're way up. Then all of a sudden, you landed. Whoa, look at that. We're up 41%. This past year, we were down 19%. So over two years, that put us up about 13%, 13 from two years ago. Got it. Nationally, from two years ago, they're even. It's flat. It's flat. Um, I think we expected there's some gravity here. I mean, at some point you just reached this. And you got to remember that for the entering class of 21, the one that you were talking about, Linda, where, where the increase was so great, um, go back to the fall of 20, because that's when people apply, the fall. Well, we had a presidential race then, didn't we? And we had all sorts of legal everything. Every minute of every day was filled with judge this and lawyer that and lawsuit this. And that attention on the law was so dramatic and vivid and all encompassing. And I have to say, for most part, in a positive way that lawyers were supply and judges were supplying the guardrails to all of this. Add that to COVID and, all, and people wanted to look towards the future. I think that's what caused this. There was some of that, but less for this now, for this entering class, which just entered in 22. But the quality went way up and stayed up. It's not That's like fantastic. it dropped down, it stayed up, which was terrific. And we weren't sure. In the year I'm in right now, and these things, you know what, that was fun. Now on to the next cycle. That's the nature of this business. Um, yeah. The short answer is I don't know. But if I had to bet, I'll just talk about Georgetown now. If I had to bet, before the surge, we were 10,000 applicants. During the surge, we were 14, 1, 14,100. Last year, we were 11,300. If I had to bet this year, we'll be about 10.5, 10 or 10.5. Okay. I think it'll drop a little. I don't know that, but I think it will. But we are, I'm excited to see what happens next. And I think um, it's going to be very hard, still going to be very, very difficult to get into places. And especially, I'm going to only speak for Georgetown. But I, it won't be at the 14,000 level. I'm almost sure. I don't think anyone will ever see that again. So you don't um, want to be that, you won't be that exhausted. No, nah, I didn't say that. I just won't be <laughs> as exhausted as I was back then. I'll be plenty exhausted, but I won't be as exhausted as that. That's right. That's right. I think okay. so. We don't know. Come yeah. back and talk to me in December and I'll have a better sense and we'll have a better sense. Right now, that'd be my guess. Okay. Thank you. Let's turn to the application, which went live on September 6th. And that's something that, unlike application volume, applicants can, can still uh, influence. Now, Georgetown accepts the LSAT, the GRE, or the GMAT. 
approximately what percentage of applicants are applying with the different tests? Or do you have a sense? Roughly of 90, about 92% are applying with the LSAT. Okay. I would say six, 7% roughly are applying with the GRE and 1% are applying with the with the GMAT. It's still very much tilted towards the LSAT. Very, very much, which is fine. I, I, I tell applicants all the time, decide which one shows you the best and shows you off the best and take some sample tests, see how that feels. And that's the one you want to take. But most students, um, it seemed back when we, we were one of the first schools that we're, we were allowed to use the GRE. At the moment, like so much else, it feels like an earthquake and it's just a, you know, a little tremor and you, everyone sort of settles down and yeah, we can live with this. So it's almost nine out of 10 and a little bit more than nine out of 10 is still taking the LSAT. Are most of the ones using either the GR, GRE or the GMAT applying to dual degree programs? I wouldn't say most, I would say a lot, certainly okay. more than the LSAT, but I would say most of these people who are taking the GREs, yes, there's that, but but these are people who just... The, the purpose of taking it, of, of us allowing students to, to supply it, was to, we were anxious to get more of the non-traditional applicants, the older applicants, the, the applicants who didn't have, for whom the LSAT was not this sort of Mount Everest to climb, but they really would like to do law, but that LSAT was just off-putting. And it's worked out that well. It's worked out well for us. So you're finding that these tools are equally predictive of success yes, in law school? for sure. Okay, okay for great. Sure. Now, if the ABA were to decide not to require a test, which they're obviously considering at this point, yep. um, would you like to see Georgetown retain the test requirement, issue waivers, or perhaps make go entirely test optional? We are beginning now in this cycle. To, I think the ABA will allow us to do it. I think it'll go school by school. Each school can have can decide for itself. I, I'm not. I don't know for sure because I need to talk to the dean and alums and all like and all the other stakeholders in this. If I had to bet today, I would bet we would be LSAT optional, okay. and we would encourage students if test they, optional or LSAT optional. Uh, probably test optional. Probably mm -hmm. test optional. Um, and I think we would we will be working on finding the right language to say, look. If you are somebody who shows this well and who sort of the LSAT can show us what it is that you're able to do, by all means, supply your LSAT. Um, if you are someone who feels as though this does not show you as well or you don't have the tool, the, um, the resources to be able to sort of prepare as well as you'd like, but man, you, you did for your grades and you did for everything else, then, that, then it will be optional. We're working through this right now, Linda. It's, it's, this is a tough one. People have very different views on this. Um, this is the first time the, there's been any crack in the foundation of the ABA ever that's sort of considered this. I think they come on, this comes on the heels of undergrads and oh, yeah. most schools having a test optional and some schools saying you can't Business submit schools. it even if you have it. Yeah, you can't Business do it. Business schools increasingly have gone. I, they, there's a lot of change in terms of testing requirements in the business school arena. Yep. accepting multiple tests like you're doing. Some are issuing test waivers. In other words, if you qualify, you can have a test waiver and right. others have gone test optional. That's probably right. the arena that's seen the most change, at least that I've seen the most change in. Yeah, and I think it's that you're going to about to have another arena, I think, and it's the law. I think right. that's happening. I think that's going to happen. There's already been some conversation and this group thinks this and that group thinks that. In the end, it'll be, I think the AB is going to say each school you decide what you want to do, and it's okay with us, whatever you want to do. So I'm not saying Georgetown is automatically going to be test optional. I don't I know that. But right now, that if I had to lean one way, that's the way I'd lean. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Now, getting to the application itself, I noticed that the diversity statement is encouraged by Georgetown. How can one write a diversity statement if one comes from a well-represented group in the applicant pool? Because, uh, uh, well, first of all, no one has to do it. It's not required. We right. encourage people to share with us what they want to do. It's part of, I mean, I'll get to this, but it's part of the overall sort of mindset we have and that I have in this. And that is, I want to know everything about you. I don't want to just know your GPA and your LSAT. I want to know everything about you. 
So diversity comes in all different shapes and sizes. Of course, there's ethnicity and that we wanna know for sure if the applicant wants to write about that. But there are other aspects about applicants that are not sort of in the traditional, this is, it, no, it, people aren't cookie cutter anymore. It just doesn't exist. What is it about you that's a little different that you wanna talk about? Now, it may be that you covered that in your personal statement. It may be that a recommender is gonna cover it and that you really don't have much to say. No one, and I can't say this clearly enough, no one is penalized for not submitting a diversity statement. It never counts against anybody. And you're right. Most people, I don't know about most, but a lot of people have gone through life and there's just nothing, you know, of that variety to share with us in that respect. Great, that's fine. We'll look at all the other aspects of it. But we don't, the idea of encouraging this is to encourage the uniqueness of the individual. What is there about you? Not about your group, not about all applicants, you. You, Linda, what is it about you, Linda, that makes you Linda? And so that's what we want to know. And that may come through in your personal statement. I'm guessing we'll get to that in a minute. But if there's some aspect of you, the uniqueness of you, that isn't present and that I don't get a sense of enough from the essay, that's what the diversity statement's for. It's a wonderful answer. I sometimes advise applicants to look at diversity in terms of what I like to call the, the DIDS, okay, Just kind of a corny acronym, identity, which would be your, your background, your ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, et cetera, deeds, exceptional things that you've done, and ideas, if you have a particular perspective uh, on life or law or whatever that would be something that one could include in a diversity statement. Would you agree or do you have a different perspective? I know, I think that that's 100% right. It could be that what you've just described has been covered in the essay. Right. It's already right. covered there. And if it is, great, you're done. You mm -hmm. don't need to say it again. I'm reading every aspect of this. But if your essay or other parts of your application um, are covering everything but that or not covering every part of what makes you, you, then have at it. We want you to take ownership of this application. We want you to present yourself in a way that gives me a great sense of who the heck you are and the uniqueness of you. Wonderful. Now, the unlike the personal statement and the optional response, there is no suggested length to the diversity statement. Do you have a recommendation or do you like to just leave it open? Both. I like to leave it open. Okay. My, rec my recommendation would be no more than two pages. Okay. And generally one page could do it. Most diversity statements are one page, but again, it's so tied with the other parts of the application that you are submitting. It's hard to give one standard answer to that. But I would say as a general, not more than two pages. And probably if you can, one would do it. You've already written two pages for your essay. There may be another addendum about some bad semester you had or something. And now suddenly I've got all of this stuff, whoa. And what I say to students, I just had one of these info sessions yesterday. And what I say to students is, look, you can submit whatever you want. You're paying a lot of money to apply, do it any way you want. But my suggestion is just send us the gold, send us the real important stuff. I'm sure there's lots of other aspects about you, but somebody's reading 11,000 applications, me, and you know what? You read all those files, if it can come across as just a little bit, this is not quite the right word, but lazy in that here's everything about me, everything. You sort out what you want out of this. Well, part of the sorting is, out, is on the applicant and you know, just carve it and make sure you've got this. This is important that you know this. If it's eh, sort of important, not so much, you run the risk of just being diluting what will be the most important piece of this. And that's the last thing you want to do. Absolutely. I would advise applicants to really think about how the diversity statement, the, the addendum and the personal statement can complement each other so that right. you get the most complete picture of the applicant. And not duplicate each other. And not Correct. duplicate. Absolutely. That's right. Um, do you like to know, let's say, why applicants in the personal statement, why they want to go to Georgetown or why they want to go into law? Is that you know, something you'd those like are two to different see addressed. Those, those are two different questions. They should be related. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, of course. Um, 
if we really needed to know what, let's do the Georgetown thing first. If we okay. really we would ask it, plenty of schools okay. do. Why Georgetown? We do not ask it. Okay. We do not ask it because if we did, everybody would answer it because we asked it. But if, and I say this to students, applicants all the time, if an applicant would like to share with us why Georgetown, why this great law school is the place they want to go, that wouldn't be the worst idea. It's not required, but when I'm reading a file, if some applicant is making a convincing case and has thought about this and thought about the connection to Georgetown, will that have a little bit of a plus? You bet. You bet. But you don't have to do it. It's not required. But if you do, it would. if it's well thought out, it wouldn't be the worst idea. On why law, again, our, our essay is wide open. You can write it about is. whatever you want. Generally, 80% of these essays get to that. The whole thing may not be about that, but they get to that. I think that's a nice idea and something I'd want to know, but I'm not, I, I, I'm just not, I'd rather not say, yes, you need to let me know this. If whatever you needed to let me know, we ask. If we didn't ask, we don't need to know. It doesn't mean we wouldn't like to know, but it just means we don't need to know. I guess the applicant has to think about what they want you to know. Right, correct. And, and whatever I want to know, it needs to be about them. It needs to be about them. If you I'm want to learn about the the politics or the family or the right, father, well, right? Exactly right. You know, in the personal statement, I say, look, this thing's got to be about you. Yeah. And if if you're gonna, the subject's wide open. You want to talk about your grandfather or your son or a trip or an internship or the marching band. You want to or the lead you had in the musical. You want to talk about all that stuff. It's all great. If that's important to you, bring it on. But I better be learning about you, not learn about your grandfather, not learning about Mount Kilimanjaro and not learning about the tuba section. I don't want it. None of those things are applying to law school. You are. So what I say to people all the time when I talk to them in front of groups, when you're done with your first draft of this thing, give it to somebody who knows you well, have them read it and ask them this question. If you've never met me before, do you know me a little better now? If the answer to that is yes, you're good. If the answer to that is no, I don't. You're not so good. Go back and do it again. Great answer. Thank you. Now, is full-time work experience a nice to have or really important to the admissions committee at Georgetown? Nice to have. Nice to have. It depends what you're doing and no one should plan what I really don't want to have happen. It happens, but I don't want to have happen. You know what? I'm not sure what job to take or even if, if to take a job, but I bet it'll help me get into law school. So I'm going to take this job. I really wanted that job. And I got offered that job. But this one seems like it'll provide blah, blah, blah. This may be the parent in me, but, it, but it, you need to do what you're happy as doing. Do I think that law students are more successful if they've been out in the world for one, two, three years. Yeah, I do. But that doesn't go for all law students. All things being equal, if you want to take some time off, do it. If you're ready to go, then don't do it. But I would strongly urge if, you can't, if you're in between, take some time off. A year is fine, but just it, I, we want students who want to be here. We want students who are ready for law school. And we find that if you've taken a little bit, it's not a requirement for goodness sakes, but if you've taken a year or two, you've paid rent, you've been out in the world, you've thought about this, you've organized the finances, you really are now, you've grown up and you're ready for this now. That's the better way to do it. It's not the only way to do it for everybody, but we find as a general matter, it's, I would prefer you do it, but it's hardly required. We take, we have plenty of, successful, lovely, highly qualified applicants who come straight out of college. But that's oh. been a big change. That's been a big change. When yeah. I began all those years ago, I would say, I don't know, 25% of our entering class back then had taken a year or more off. 25%, 75% coming right out of college. In 2022, those numbers are almost exactly reversed. Almost exactly. 25% right out of college, 70 to 75% out in the work world. Right. That makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. You know, I was on, on some forum and I saw somebody saying, you know, I want to go travel the world for a year. 
Is that going to hurt my chances of admission? I mean, I would say go travel the world. What a fantastic experience. It'll expand your, your horizons enormously. But what if that person who traveled the world also didn't have any kind of serious exposure to law? In other words, my question is, do you want, would you prefer applicants who had some exposure to law, either by working in a law office or a legal clinic or whatever? I certainly understand they don't have to do that, but is that part of showing that you know what you're getting into? Yes, for some people, sure. But again, I, I know this is wordplay, but I would differentiate between preferring, sure, all things mean equal. It's better to have that than not have that. But that's a very different statement than it will cost you or hurt you if you don't have that. I don't feel that way at all. Any student, you know, you're going to be 21 or 22 and you're going to get a chance to travel the world. That ain't coming around every year. And as you get older, so is that a great experience to do? Sure. And there are ways of talking about this. There are ways of making you more ready for school. It depends on the individual. But for that answer, go travel the world. If it's, you know what, I'm not sure, should I work in law? I've got this great opportunity and I've got this equally great one I can't make up my mind. Then the tie goes to law. But I would not, you know, make that, force that into my life if something else were more appealing at this stage. Go do that. You'll be ready. And then come apply. And then we'll be happy to take a look at you. Okay, great. Now, obviously, if you have, whether you have 10,000 or 11,000 or 14,000 applicants, applications, that's a lot to wade through. You could just ask for a test score and GPA if that was the only thing you were considering. Clearly, Georgetown Law considers other factors and asks for personal statement, diversity statement, there's an optional essay, there's experience descriptions. What are you hoping to see in those elements of the application? It's not what I'm hoping to see, it's who I'm hoping to see. Okay. And it's just, it really is, I, I know I keep coming back to this, but I do because it's so true. It's me getting to know you. And, and now part of getting to know you is how you will fit into this community. How you will, are you ready for this? Do you really want to do this? Are you, you know, have you thought about this? So all of that plays into this. And I've done this enough now so that when you read all of these aspects to every applicant, you get a sense, you know, somebody asked me the other day, do we use algorithms? And I said to them, the only algorithm I use are my fingertips. And I swear to goodness, that's it. That's it. No formulas in this. Like you said, if all I cared about was GPA and LSAT, I could take six months off because we could not even sure you need a person to do that. You got machines yeah. that can do this. So I, what I'm looking to see is I'm just trying, it's not so much that as I'm trying to sort of get an x-ray of you an x-ray of who you are, what makes you tick, how you're going to fit in here. There's one other element to this, to our process that Georgetown does, some of which I think most schools do, one of which I don't think any other law school does, and that is the interview. Interviews matter to us. It's all part of the same theme you've heard me talk about ad nauseum here. That matters a lot to us. So we have a traditional alumni interview program where we have alums in Providence and you know, Buffalo and in San Diego and in Santa Fe. And they're, now with Zoom, they can, you know, it used to be, it used to be if you lived in that area, but with Zoom now, everybody lives in the same area. The way I'm living, sure. I'm in the same room with you. Right. You're 3,000 miles away. So, That's I mean, right. so in that respect, we don't do it that way. It's mainly Zoom, but it's an alum. We, we've sifted through the alums, an alum who gets to meet our applicants. Now, a lot of law schools do that. Almost all undergraduate schools do that. What we do is... The person who wants to, to know most about you is me, the one you're talking to right now, me. So I have, we at Georgetown over the last 10, eight years or so, we have grown and grown to where I'm meeting groups of students. I meet applicants in groups. We do group interviews. And by we, I mean me, we do group interviews. And so I'll meet six or seven people at a time on the Zoom and spend an hour with them. I'm not going to say any more than that, but we spend okay. an hour an hour with them. Now I will, you know, this thing is built up now. So last year I met almost 4,000 applicants myself on screens like this. And it was, in, it is enormously helpful to me. It, it does, it helps with the x-ray. It's like, I can really get to know you, not really get to know you like if you and I hung out together for a month, but where I could really 
you become more than just a file. And it's human. wonderful, correct. And it's been wonderful. And because of Zoom, I've been able to travel the world and not leave my office. It's been grand. And so I'm talking to people in 50 states. Now, I should be, we should be clear on this. There are, I don't, not everybody I interview gets in. Not everybody who enrolls I've interviewed. And plenty of people get in who I don't. But I will tell you that last year, I met 90% of the entering class myself in Is sessions it, like this. Are the interviews by invitation only? Yes. Yes. We'll but find you don't you. have you don't have to interview to be admitted. That's correct. That's correct. I mean, people get in without being interviewed. They do. But there's a certain segment. There's a process that goes through when I read a file that first time. And I say to myself, I'd like to meet her. I'd like to meet him. And when we do, we invite them and they come and we schedule them. And I'm doing this three, four hours a day for five months straight. So this stuff matters. You know, nobody in their right mind does this unless it has an impact on, on the admissions process. But it's all part of the same thing. Who are you? Let me get to know you. Not just what's on the, we don't do paper anymore, but not just what's on the paper or whatever on the screen, but what's what makes you tick and how are you? And I, will you collaborate? Can you work together? That's why I love doing the groups. Individual is interesting, but the group stuff enables me to watch people work together. And it's something you just, I just have a sense of now. I've done so many of these. So it's a fun part. Our first one starts next week. Um, applications have come in, as you mentioned, September 6th was when the opening bell was. And now here we go again. That was fun last year and I'll go do it again. So that's what we're doing. Okay. That was, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, how do you view applications from students who have an academic infraction or perhaps even a criminal record? It all depends on the individual situation. If it's an academic misconduct, if it's an honor code violation, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. That's, but, you know, plenty of people, that happened 10 years ago. It happened five years ago. It happened seven years ago. Or it happened last week. And the key to that, there's three, diff three legs to this stool. There's what was the violation? What was the nature of the violation? Is how do you talk about it? And then how does your school talk about it? And so if that applies to you, if there was some sort of, and I'm not talking about, you know, you got caught, caught smoking dope on campus or something, or you got whatever, I don't know, you parked where you shouldn't have parked and you were given a citation, who cares? But there's, there's some real serious stuff. And if that's you, if that's who's ever listening to this, if that's you, it's your, if you want this to work, You've got to go talk to somebody at your undergraduate institution who will, is an old fashioned term, vouch for you, who will say this happened to her. Let me give you the context. This isn't who she is anymore or whatever. Don't think we won't pick up on it. We pick up on everything. So I want to hear what you have to say about it. I want to hear what somebody from your school has to say about it. Same thing goes for criminal violations. Obviously, there's different degrees of this, and it's not a good thing to have a record, for goodness sakes but there are different aspects to this and different contexts. It's on the applicant to sort of supply that context, obviously in the way most favorable to the applicant, but that's on her or him. That's not on me. Is taking responsibility part of the- right. um... You bet. You bet. I don't want to hear excuses. I want to hear, you know, again, that's the parent in me maybe, but, but I want to know the context. I want to know how long ago it was? Where are you now? What steps have you taken? And then I want to hear from somebody, not you, who can talk about this and can put it in context. And that can help. It doesn't wash it away. It's part of who you are and what you've done. But there's a million things of who you are and what you've done. This is one of them. It's big. But if you can explain it away, it doesn't. it's not an automatic anything. Got it. Um, does Georgetown Law consider update letters from applicants who have something significant to tell you after they submit their application before hearing back from you or perhaps from waitlisted applicants? Yes, and yes, capital letters, exclamation points. You bet. Okay. You bet. Just, Life just changes. Stay Stuff yeah. happens. Stay in touch with us. Well, we've got, I've got a terrific staff here. They'll add it. That'll be part of it. And I'll come back again if someone, someone flags and says, you know what? Linda Abrams' um, application just got updated. You might want to take a look at that. And so I will. Yes, absolutely. I mean, especially on the wait list, especially on the wait list. Yeah. Okay, great. Good to know. What is the common mistake you see applicants making during the application process? Not working hard enough at it. 
not working hard enough. At what do you mean? It. I mean, an essay that feels very cookie cutter with no particular, I mean, my sense is, again, I, I've taken this exam lots of times. I know the answers to the test on this. And so I can, you know, if someone who is just a little bit not as energetic in how they apply, not as, you know, they applied late, their essay is a little messy. It's long. It's very long. They haven't, um, they haven't really organized. I can tell this in a, in a heartbeat. And that's, I think, the biggest mistake. It, that and, and this is a common one, it's not as fatal as the first one, keeping arm's length in the application process. So not getting, no matter how many times I say it, I want to get to know you well. People are just wired differently. And you don't have to tell me every aspect of your life, but to keep me at arm's length just for this particular admissions dean, that doesn't work so well with me. So what, what I say to people all the time is the two key words that I that every applicant should try to be at Georgetown. Again, I'm not talking about other law schools. I don't care. For Georgetown, the two key words are open and authentic. Be open and be authentic. If you're those two things, that puts you and will put me in the right frame of mind. Again, I'm trying to get to know you. If you don't, if you won't let me get to know you, if you want to keep arms length and like this. I'm not saying you won't get in, but I'm, you know, I'm a little less likely to, to say this is someone we really want at Georgetown. Because remember, every applicant and everyone listening to this should remember, anytime we say what I just said, this is somebody we really want at Georgetown, you get in, full stop. That's it. You get in. So, I mean, I can't take everybody I really want at Georgetown, but the ones who take that extra little, they were fabulous at the interview. They were, their essay was wonderful. They just have come across as though this is someone who'd be great. You know, we would love having here. You're going to get in, but you got to make that case. You, the applicant, have to make that case. Have at it. I'm open. Numbers aren't going to automatically qualify you or disqualify you. I say to students all the time, the way to, to think of this is that your GPA and LSAT, assume you take the LSAT, your GPA and LSAT, they sort of set the height of the bar you got to jump over. And now I read all the other stuff about you. And depending on how high that bar is, that's how good the other stuff has to be. And so if you look at it that way, that's exactly how we do it. But always, applicants should always remember, everybody gets to jump over the bar. There are no cutoffs. Everybody gets a shot. It's harder if the bar is up here than it is here. But everybody gets a shot and, and everybody has to jump. You don't just get to walk around and not have to get up and over the bar. I need to, you need to persuade us too. We have too many great applicants at this law school for you just to kind of, here are my numbers. I assume you're going to say yes. Well, don't assume that. Don't do it. And the way that comes across, that's the mistake I was talking about where I can, I can sense that. These are the fingertips. I can sense it. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's great advice. Thank you so much. What would you have liked me to ask you? Ah, oh, you did real good. I mean, you asked just about everything I want you to ask me. I think it, the, the one thing I would think of, and again, you've asked just about everything. Thank you. Um, what is, not a mistake, but what turns you off? Okay, that's a great question. I'll have to add it to my, my routine. <laughs> okay. What turns you, what turns, not turns you off like I'm done, see you around, but what, what, hurts you. Like, I, I don't know, I, whatever the term is. Um, and I think I'd give you two words for this too. What hurts you the most? Laziness and arrogance. I was thinking arrogance. That was what was going to my either head. Either of those two things. Don't be either of those two things. You can study law somewhere else. I got too many applicants who are wonderful and fabulous and who are sitting on a wait list or who couldn't quite make it in five years ago. They could have but it's different now. It's different now here at this law school. So if you think you're going to waltz right in, no waltzing at this law school. Maybe you can waltz when you get in and celebrate with a waltz, but you're not waltzing in. Don't act like you are. So it's that arrogance part. Laziness too. Those are the two things I'd stay away from. That's, that's what can hurt you. And arrogance can lead to laziness. Yeah. Right. 
All right. Dean Kornblatt, I think we're almost out of time. This has been absolutely fantastic and very, very informative. Thank you so much for joining me and sharing your insider perspective and experience. Where can listeners learn more about Georgetown Law? Uh, if you go on uh, at www.law at georgetown.edu. And we, we look forward to hearing from you. The, the one thing we didn't cover, Linda, okay, just go one ahead. quick thing, just one sure. quick thing. Sure. Uh, well, two minor things. I know we're running out of time. Um, there's the when to apply. Okay. There's, there's, there's a, that's an element of this. And it, okay. it, it, it plays a role in this. We have rolling admissions. Most law schools do. It's different than undergrad. When mm -hmm. they send out, most, law, most undergrads send out decisions December 15th and April 1st or whenever it is they do it. Here at this law school, it's rolling. That means the sooner you apply, the better your chances. People apply, applications get completed, maybe I interview or whatever, and we, we admit people. I'll start admitting people in the middle of October. And if you view sort of a classroom of X number of seats and someone wants to be in that class, they can't wait to be, you know, they're having a party, Cornblatt's throwing a party. I'd love to, oh, those Cornblatt parties are so great. I'd love <laughs> to come, I'd love to come. So if you ask for your invitation and the room is emptier, you're more likely to get a yes than if the, as the room gets fuller and fuller and fuller. So that first knock on the door to come to my party is November, October, November. The second knock on my door when you, it gets so much harder is February. So while the recommended deadline may be March 1, I would recommend for all students, if they can, let it be Thanksgiving. Plenty of people apply then, but at, in January, February, and December. But if you're listening to this and if you're ready to go, go. Don't wait around. Seats get used up. Last thing I would say is there's two different ways to apply to Georgetown Law School, early decision and regular decision. Regular decision is, is, was created. Typical way to apply. Students would love to come to Georgetown. Why wouldn't you? Would love to come to Georgetown. They'd be thrilled. But they're not ready to commit yet. They're not there yet. And you know what? That's 85% of our pool. 85% of our pool fits that description. But there's 10 to 15% for whom Georgetown is their first choice. Full stop. I'm done. If, if Dean Andy sends me an email that begins with that delicious word, congratulations, I am in. I can hear him shrieking of joy in my apart in my house here in DC. If that's where you want, if this is where you want to go, apply early decision. Um, does it help your chances a little? Yep, a little bit, a little bit. And we do. I'm sure you've had this question a million times, but let me just speak for Georgetown. Early decision admits, regular decision admits are treated exactly the same way for financial aid. We do not, an early decision admit is not, I, my, I say this everywhere, so my honesty is on the line. I promise you, it won't matter in terms of the, the financial aid award you get, whether you're early or regular. So I just wanted to add those two things. Um, thank you so much. That was a fantastic addition. You bet. Well, thank you for having me. It's really nice to talk to you. I look forward to reading, those of you who are listening to this, I look forward to reading your applications and hopefully welcome you at law school 12 months from now, maybe, who knows. Um, but get good. your applications in and I'm excited to read and get on to this next cycle. Thanks so much for Sounds having me. Linda. Good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And thank you, you listeners also for joining me for this wonderful interview with Dean Andrew Kornblatt of Georgetown Law. We'll include links in the show notes at accept.com slash 489 to Georgetown Law's website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Quick reminder, don't miss the law school admissions quiz, which I mentioned at the very, very beginning. Find out if you're really ready to apply and competitive at your targeted schools. Take the quiz at accepted.com slash law dash quiz today. This is Admissions Trade Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.